Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. We're ready to continue on. Mr. Olson, if you'd like to call your next witness, please. Uh, thank you, Judge. Before I do that, uh, I'll just let the court and jurors know we're going to be going back to some photographs, so if they want to reposition themselves how they were the other day. Okay. And while they're doing that, uh, I will call uh, Brian Harris to the stand. Please raise your right hand. You swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Have seats. State your name for the record. Brian Harris. Good afternoon, Mr. Harris. Good afternoon. Um, your former occupation was what, sir? Uh, I was a detective with the Muskegon County Sheriff's Department. Mm -hmm. and, and how long were you a detective with, or I guess, first and foremost, how long were you with the Sheriff's Department? 28 years. And how long were you detective with the Sheriff's Department? I think about eight or nine years. And uh, you have since retired? That's correct. All right. Uh, and, and that's why we're calling you Mr. Brian Harris instead of detective. Why, thank you. Um, now, back on June 29th of 2014, were you employed at the Sheriff's Department? That's correct. And you were the detective bureau at the time? I was. Now, uh, your primary responsibility in the de detective bureau was what? I'll take care of the evidence. And on uh, June 29th, 2014, uh, did you, in fact, uh, go to the scene at Automobile Road? I did. And again, was that for the primary purpose of collecting evidence? It was. Okay. Uh, when you arrived on the scene, uh, what did you, what were your initial observations? Well, I've been contacted by my command officer about the uh, possibility of a homicide up in that uh, location. And uh, when I proceeded to the scene, there were an ambulance there, a uh, couple fire trucks, a couple sheriff's department cruisers. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the uh, things that you collected. We're going to, we've got uh, multiple things to look at. Here. Alrighty. First and foremost, I want to direct you to uh, People's Exhibit 5. Uh, what are we looking at in that particular photograph? Yeah, that was located on the, on the side of the road, on the east side of the road, uh, near where they, that victim was. And it's a, it's a pink cell phone holder. I think I might have called it an activity holder. You generally would wear it on your arm when you're working out. Okay. Uh, what else was part of that? Uh, it had a cell phone inside of it and a set of earbuds. And then there was a set of uh, black sunglasses as well. All right. Uh, and uh, you collected those things? I did. handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 150. Uh, could you describe what we have packaged there, please? Uh, that's, it's the um, pink, and I, I listed it as pink and gray, uh, iPhone holder or activity holder. All right. And is that what is depicted in uh, People's Exhibit 5? Yes, it is. been marked as People's Exhibit 151. Uh, what do we have in that package? This is the uh, Harley Davidson sunglasses and it also has the uh, white set of earbuds headphones. Okay and again that's what we have depicted in People's Exhibit 5? Uh, correct. Okay and both or I should say all three of those items were collected by you? Correct. Okay. Um, Let's talk about, uh, did you 
discover outside of, of this particular item in the roadway, was there anything of else of interest to you in the roadway? Yes, we discovered a, a single 22 uh, fired cartridge. Okay. Um, showing you a photograph here of what is Dickens Exhibit 7. What are we looking at this photograph? That's the uh, shell casing that was in the roadway that I collected. you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 152 is uh, that uh, the single shell casing that's depicted in That's correct. Um, now, obviously the, the, the items that we've talked about thus far had been discovered by some road deputies prior to your arrival. That That's true. Accurate. And uh, did you do any further digging, if you will, around the scene to see if you could collect any other additional pieces of evidence? I did. What did you do? I checked the road edges to see if there was anything else out of the ordinary, and eventually I did uh, discover another uh, single 22 uh, spent cartridge in the uh, on the west side of the road. Okay. I'm going to show you. I'm going to start with People's Exhibit 13. Give me one second. Okay. People's Exhibit 13. What are we looking at in this photograph? Um, the placard number five is where, by where the shell casing that I found was, and the two circles in front of it are were what was believed to be blood spots from the victim. Okay. So, is it safe to say, uh, well, if we're comparing the proximity of the shell casing that was discovered in the roadway versus the shell casing you discovered in the weeds there, uh, which one was closer? Closer to what? Cl I'm sorry. Good question. Closer to the, the two circle blood spots? Uh, the number five was closer. The one in this picture. Okay. Um, People's Exhibit 14 is, uh, is what? It's just a closer up view of the uh, shell casing. All right. And then finally, uh, 15. Right. That's kind of an overhead where you can finally see the the shell casing above it, if you look straight up, uh, just about in the center, more towards the top, you can see the shell casing. Okay. So your placard five is identifying that particular shell casing that's located just, as you indicated, in the upper part of that picture. That's correct. And I assume you collected that one as well? I did. Alright, I, I want you to hold on to 153 for one second. Right. Um, now, at some point in time, we're going to kind of work backwards here. At some point in time, uh, Mr. Harris, were you made aware of that there might be possibly a third shell casing to find? That's correct. And, and how, were, what was the, how did that transpire? Uh, I think Detective Gabriel went to the autopsy and informed either me directly or my lieutenant, and he told me that she had three uh, gunshot wounds. Okay. So, uh, what, as a result of that information, what did you do? I uh, went back up to the scene the next day. 
So that would have been June 30th? Correct. And uh, where, where did you look on June 30th? In the same general area. We, we, uh, we were also told that, that there, there were bullet fragments, but it looked like possibly one bullet had passed through or, or ricocheted, so I was hoping to maybe find an actual bullet and uh, might be a third shell casing. Okay. Now, uh, so working backwards from your answer there, were you able to find a, a fired round? Or yes. Spent round? Yes. Spent round or spent shell casing? Spent shell casing. Okay. So I'll go back to my original question. Did you, did you find a spent round, an extra spent round at the scene? The shell casing I found there. I did not find any actual bullets. Okay. This is People's Exhibit uh, 16. What are we looking at in this photograph? That's the uh, shell casing we found the, the second day on the 30th. Okay. And again, you at the bottom of that picture, that kind of the spray painted oval there, is that, what is that? Those are the uh, uh, blood spots that we had marked from the day before. Okay. <coughs> uh, <coughs> looking at the next exhibit, which I believe is 17, what are we looking at in this photograph? Right, that's the same uh, shell casing from the 30th. It's just a close-up. Uh, Detective Orison was with me from the city police, and he's pointing it out with an in ink pen as well, so to make sure you can see it good in the picture. Okay. Now, uh, as far as reference is concerned, um, as we look at where your placard 5 and placard 6 were uh, in relation to each other, your, can you give us an estimate as to how close? Yeah, it was within two or three feet of where we found the other one that was off the road the day before. All right. So the two shell casing, well, so you've got one shell casing in the roadway. Correct. And then two relatively close to one another in the weeds there. Correct. Okay. And is it safe to say the distance between this shell casing and the one in the roadway, is it about the same as, as the first one you found, or, or is there any difference? Uh, it was probably a little east another foot or two, but in the gen, they, like I say, they were within a couple feet, and they're probably 10 feet away from the one on the road. Okay. Um, now you also, well, okay, so before I finish off with that, so both exhibit 152 and 153, they represent what? A uh, total of three shell casings found at the scene. Okay. And those are the ones that you had collected, the two on the 29th and the one on the 30th? Correct. All right. Now, you talked about the autopsy. Did, did you receive back from um, the doctor, the ME, the bullet fragments you had talked about? Yes. Okay. been marked as People's Exhibit 154. What are we looking at there? Uh, it's a bullet fragment and, and a partial bullet as well. So several fragments, I guess. Okay. It's marked as People's Exhibit 155. What is that? Uh, it's, a, it's listed as a projectile fragment. It's another piece of a bullet. Is that also from the autopsy? It is. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right, I want you to take a peek here. Let me go back. People's Exhibit 6. Give me one second, Mr. Harris. All right. 
Uh, can you see the circle in the roadway there? I can. Uh, is that, and then I think the casing is still present in this photograph, is that right? Yeah, it looks like it. And then the two circles to the left, uh, which would be the, the what? We've got blood spots. Okay. Now, I know it's not in this picture, but uh, it just as a frame of reference, the other two spent shell casings were found um, beyond, you know, just a little bit beyond the yellow circles. Is that correct? Yes. That's the west side of the road. So they were further west and, and just, a, just a hair um, to the south of, of those circles. Now, from your from your experience, uh, Mr. Harris, um, is, is there any conclusions that can be drawn as to the positions of these shell casings? It certainly could indicate that the shooter moved, fired in the center of the road, and moved towards the edge of the road and fired again. Okay, I'm sorry. I, uh, I couldn't. Understand. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I just said it could indicate that the the shooter shot one shot where the shell was located in the road and then moved to the west, and that could be could be an explanation why the other two were off the side of the road. So, in other words, uh, if if one shot knocked Miss Fletch down, the other two could have been closer where she was lying. Correct. Um, Your Honor, I would move for the admission of uh, 150 through 155. Those are all ballistics? Yeah, uh, well, it's, it, I'm sorry, Judge. 150 is the pink armband. Okay. 151 is the sunglasses and the earbuds. 152 and 153 represent the three shell casings. And 154 and 155 represent uh, the bullets, the fragments. What do you, Your Honor? May. Thank you. Uh, Mr. could you put uh, the four of Exhibit 5 back up again? Sure. All right. Uh, Mr. Harris, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, in that fo the con that photograph there, the contents of that photograph are in the bags 150 and 50 and 151. Is that correct? Uh, correct. All right. Now, the way we see them there, is that how you found them, or or were the contents that we see there folded and placed inside the the activity bag when they were, when it was found? Uh, that's how I found them. Okay. So when you found them, they were already removed from the, the, the activity bag itself. In other words, they were out and open. You can look just like over here. Yeah, that's how, that's how it was when I got there. Okay. That's correct. All right. And finally, I think it's uh, uh, 154. There, There's a bullet and some uh, partial bullets or, or fragments. Right. It, yes. And, and that's how they were uh, provided to you from the ME? Correct. Detec Detective Gabriel actually went to the autopsy and he brought them back with, with personal items and stuff. So he listed it. Um, I personally haven't seen what's inside this. It went, went to the lab and, and he brought it. But that's how it's described by Detective Gabriel. So you don't know what they look you, you They weren't in a baggie and then put no. in there in front of you and you don't know what they look like? No. Would you know if they're segregated inside? In other words, are the fragments segregated from the, the, the bullet inside that packaging? I don't know. Okay. We can certainly open it up, Mr. Um, could we? Yeah, absolutely. Quick, if you don't mind, just, I don't, the only question I have is, is to find out if they're segregated. So oh. if you just take a yeah. look, that's all I need. A absolutely. I'll oh, cut them off.
personal thing. This is the one you described there. Look at the top. Make sure. Is that the one? This one, the bullets in the fragments, right? Uh, bullets. 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 Yes. All right, somebody's got small hands. These are sealed mm -hmm. there, so these were probably sealed by Detective Gabriel here. Okay. So these three are from them, and they all say either uh, fragments on them, basically. Okay, and it looks like they're individually wrapped. Yes, right. correct. I have no objection to making those. Okay. So now I'm, I'm showing 1 through 55 except for 22. Thank you. I have no other questions for uh, to, uh, Mr. Harris. Any cross-exam, Mr. Johnson? Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Harris. Good afternoon. Uh, can you, do, do you have any recollection as to... Uh, can I take uh, these off? You certainly may. Thank you. There were three bullet shell casings found at the scene. Correct. One in, one close to the center row and then the other two in the, in the grass, as, as you showed. Correct. Them. Okay, as, as to the two that are in the grass, the ones that you found, or that were found secondary. Yes. Can you, do you have any idea how close those shell casings were to where Mrs. Bletch fell? No, she had already been moved. Okay. I, it would only be a guess, okay. based on the blood spots. How far were, were they from the blood spots? Uh, not very far, three, four feet maybe okay. at the most. And, and, okay, strike that. Um, When you arrived on the scene, um, obviously you're an experienced detective. What sorts of things were you looking for when you got there? Obviously, Ms. Bletch was already gone, so what were you looking for when you got there? Uh, just anything out of place, anything out of the ordinary. Okay. I mean, we, we saw her personal items there. I didn't know if there were more personal items, a purse, shoes, you know, and of course we see one shell casing. We're looking for more shell casings, looking for a weapon, stuff like that. Were you looking for footprints, maybe in the soft gravel or anything? Uh, we yes, I'm sure we did. Yeah. Were you looking for tire treads or tire skid marks or anything along those lines? Yeah, I'm sure. Did you? Were you looking for any perhaps disturbances in in the tall grasses there? If it was obvious, yes. Okay, because I assume it occurred to you that the, the assailant may have been hiding in the grass. Yes. Right? And so you're looking for something that might indicate there was a person there recently. Right. And you didn't find any broken twigs or stuff like that that might. I mean, yeah, there were some, uh, actually some matted down weeds because the weeds were, you know, one, two foot tall there, uh, right over by the body, but there was nothing out of the, I mean, I assumed it was one of the medical people stepping off, helping, or one of the people giving CPR. But that was on the side of the road where the body was. That correct. Was correct, and, and the first shell casing was, came from the other side of the road, at least. The in the middle, yep, yeah, more in the middle, yep. Yeah. please? Sure. Like there's kind of a, a red spot on the uh, uh, sports uh, band. Do, were you able to identify what that was? Or no. Do you know if anyone, well, your experienced detective, did it appear to you to be blood, human blood? Or it, human blood? It, 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 
I wasn't sure. I don't know if okay. it was or not. Yeah, we sent it to the lab, so I assumed that they would uh, check it for anything okay. like that. Leave everything here, DJ. Yes, leave it right there. Please. Uh, thank you, Judge. <coughs> People of the state of Michigan call Dr. Brady Shattuck to the stand. Please raise your right hand. If you swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please state your name for the record. Brandy, B R A N D Y, Shattuck, S H A T T U C K. Good afternoon, Dr. Shattuck. Good afternoon. Um, will you tell the jury what you do for a living? Yes, I am a forensic pathologist and an assistant professor of pathology. And uh, how long have uh, you done both of those jobs? Well, I've been a forensic pathologist for about five years and assistant professor for the same amount of time. Now, uh, in order to uh, do what you do, yes, uh, can you describe for the jury, please, your experience? Or, I'm sorry, your training in education. Of course. I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan. I have a medical degree from Albany Medical College in Albany, New York. I have completed a residency in anatomic and clinical pathology at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. I have completed a board certified forensic pathology fellowship at the Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences. I have medical licenses in Texas, Missouri, Indiana, and Michigan. And I have passed board certifications in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, and forensic pathology. And, and roughly, Dr. Shattuck, uh, could you describe for the jury your, your experience? In other words, obviously, as a forensic pathologist, your primary role is to perform autopsies and draw conclusions from those findings. If I'm boiling it down to its simplest form. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, and uh, on average, uh, how many autopsies uh, do you perform in a, in a year? Uh, that, that can be variable. I can say that thus far I've done uh, approximately a thousand examinations and averaging that out, it's probably around 200 or so, but sometimes it's more and sometimes it's less. Now, um, your group uh, the the uh, facility that you work for is the is the facility or the medical examiner for Muskegon County. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, do you service other counties? Yes. What other counties? Okay. So we're going to work down. We have Grand Travers, Leelanau, Mason, Muskegon. Then we get Allegan, Van Buren. We'll move over to Kalamazoo, St. Joseph, Calhoun. And uh, it, it, I, I'm, I'm assuming, but I'll ask the question, uh, as part of the, uh, your overall, because uh, not all autopsies are, are based on criminal investigations. Correct? That is correct. Uh, but uh, criminal investigations or autopsies as a result of criminal investigations are part of your experience. Yes. Okay. And you've performed, I'm assuming, many of those over the course of your career. Yes. Now, has you all, have you also testified in court before as an expert in forensic technology? Yes. How many times? Oh, probably 15 to 20. All right. And each one of those 15 to 20 times were you qualified as an expert in the field? Yes, I was. Your Honor, based on uh, Dr. Shattuck's testimony, I would offer her as an expert in the area of forensic pathology. What do you, Your Honor? Okay. Dr. 
Shannon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Fred Johnson. I'd like to ask you a couple more questions about the qualifications. Of course. Um, with, with you said your group is, is contracted with a number of county governments. What yes. is your group? Uh, we are the Department of Pathology at the Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine. We call it WMED because it is very long. Okay. That's it, Western Michigan. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. And and it is you have your department has contracts with each of those county governments in order to perform services. Uh, either our department or the medical school. I'm not quite sure on the formality, but one of the two. And, and are there other individuals in your department who are also called upon based on these contracts to go out and do or to do out autopsies and then perhaps to be called by the, the governments to come and t testify or or, or, to see, or a report on the autopsies? Yes. Okay. And uh, how, let's, you, you mentioned you've been called uh, 10 to 15 times to, to testify uh, yourself? About 15 to 20. 15 to 20. My 15 to 20 times to testify yourself? About, yes. And uh, on those occasions, when you've been called to testify, have they always been, have the, has the party that has called you always been the prosecuting attorney's office? I think. I believe so, yes. Okay. Well, have you ever test, have you ever been called to testify by uh, a defense attorney or a defense of agency? I have been order? called on civil suits, and so I don't know exactly who the party was. Okay. But in terms of criminal investigations, uh, in criminal cases, there's always been the prosecutor's attorney who's called you to testify. I believe so, yes. Thank you. I'm for the question. And I have no objection to uh, Dr. Shadd's uh, qualifications, John. Okay, so she will be allowed to testify as an expert in the field of forensic pathology, and you may proceed, Mr. Thank you, Wilson, to examine her on that basis. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Dr. Shaddock, were you assigned as the forensic pathologist in this particular case, the Rebecca Bletch uh, homicide? Yes, I was. All right. And um, if you could, just in a general sense, explain to the jury the procedure that you go through when uh, a body comes in and you're asked to, to perform the autopsy. What, what on, on, a, on a routine basis, what do you do? Of course. So we have a numbering system. And so uh, every case gets a sequential number with a W and the year in front of it. So this case is W14-18. Um, that number will be found in uh, all photographs. It will be on my report. And it will be on any other associated lab work. So that's our internal assigned number for that case. Once the uh, decedent arrives, uh, it's standard that either myself or one of my assistants will start with a photograph of uh, how that person was received. And that includes the body bag, if they were still clothed, if they had been in a hospital, whatever medical intervention would still be on them. So we take photographs of exactly how we saw the decedent when they came in. And then uh, those items are documented in my report, along with the photographs. Um, and as we go along, uh, we may collect evidence, um, if indicated. Um, that could be the clothing. That could be samples from the body, say fingernails or swabs. And then once that is completed, uh, we will remove clothing, uh, remove evidence of any medical intervention like IVs or uh, EKG pads, things like that. Uh, take another round of photos and uh, clean the body after all evidence has been gathered. And at that time, uh, start documenting, uh, along with what we'd already seen, any evidence of injury or natural disease or piercings or tattoos, anything on the outside of the body, and that will be also in the report and in photographs. And then after the entire outside has been examined, um, the uh, body will be uh, examined internally. So myself and my assistants will uh, make an incision and look for any evidence of injury, trauma, or natural disease uh, inside the body cavities or the head and then uh, each organ is individually examined once again to look for any signs of trauma or disease. Uh, blood samples or other samples as indicated are taken throughout this process uh, so that we can eventually send off for any further blood work or testing 
and then after all the organs have been looked at and all of the samples have been obtained, uh, they're sent off for further testing and I gather more information either in medical records, EMS reports, police reports, anything that pertains to how that body came to be in my facility and once I have all of my results back, I will put all of those together into a final report and a death certificate. Thank you, doctor. Uh, now, as a result of your work in this case, did you uh, author a report? Yes, uh, I did. Based on your examination and your findings? <coughs> yes. All right. I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 156. Uh, could you just page through that and, and make sure that that's the report or at least the copy of the report that you offered in this particular case? Yes. All right. Hang on to that, please, okay. if you would. Because uh, I'd like to, and, and certainly if you need to reference it, let me know. So of course. I can ask the proper question. But uh, first and foremost, uh, it, the People's Exhibit 156, is that the uh, complete report you did as a result of your autopsy of Rebecca Black? Yes, this is my complete report. All right. Now, uh, that examination took place on what day? That would have happened on June 30th of 2014. All right. So the day after she was discovered. I believe so, yes. Okay. And uh, as you uh, did your uh, external, uh, if you will, examination of Miss Fletch, uh, can you describe, and, and we'll reference some photographs here too. Okay. Uh, let's do the verbal first and then we'll go to the photographs. Of course. As you did your external examination of Ms. Bletch, uh, did you discover any injuries of note? Yes. Uh, through the course of the examination, uh, four different uh, gunshot wounds were found on the head in the hairline of the scalp. Um, along with that, there was uh, ecchymosis or bruising or discoloration around the eyes there were abrasions, which are little scabs, um, on parts of the face, the wrist. Uh, there were contusions, which are bruises, um, also on the face, the wrists, uh, the thigh. Uh, there were some abrasions and contusions on the right shoulder and the left, more along the lines of side to back. Now, uh, could you describe also Miss um, Fletch's hair uh, yeah. and the significance it played in, in your examination? Yes. Um, the decedent had very long, thick, dark hair. And uh, this can make finding wounds in the scalp sometimes difficult. So, And the hair was also wet and bloody. So going through to find the wounds uh, my assistant and I had to move a lot of hair out of the way. All right. Let's start with your, your after your kind of um, general observations of the, of the body itself, let's focus in on the head. Okay. And I want to focus in on uh, people's, I just got to get the number right. Sure. People's Exhibit 18, mm -hmm. uh, which is a photograph. Uh, and this should coincide along with, I think, your report. So we're talking yes. about gunshot wound A. Uh, this is... Actually, I believe B, which okay. is connected to A. Well, yeah, I think A is part of that picture, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, A and B, the one that you can see better is B. All right, so go, go ahead. I think, well, hold on a second. I may have a better, a clearer shot. There we go. Yes. All right, yes. go ahead. Um, you want me to go from this one? You can go to that, or you sure. can flip this. It Either, doesn't make any difference. Whichever you would prefer. Just so that the jury the understands. Page. 
People's Exhibit 18 is the same as 19, except it looks like maybe you've shaved some hair. Yes, okay. I, I did. Once we found the wounds, I had to shave the hair out of the way so we could see the wounds better. All right, so let's talk about gunshot wound A. Yes. So uh, A is going to be the more round one, and B is the one that's going to be a little more linear or angular. Okay. So uh, this is going to be on the back part of the head and off to the left. So here-ish would be the rough description down there. Uh, the more rounded one, which is A, uh, you can see there's an area about a millimeter around on the sides. Uh, that's what we call a marginal abrasion, and that's found with entrance wounds. So that uh, is an entrance wound, A and uh, the projectile or bullet uh, goes in and in this case it happens to have a bit of an angle and so a portion of material of the, the projectile or bullet uh, is found underneath the skin, a portion was found in the hair, and a portion uh, seems to have left through that other wound B, the more linear so uh, you kind of answered what my next question was, but a as you were able to take a, a, a deeper look at this, and, and maybe the better question is describing for the jury, based on what you're able to see both externally and internally, the path of this particular yep. wound. Mm -hmm. So uh, this one is going to be going uh, basically from left to right, and it's going from back towards the front, and it goes a bit upward. Now, uh, as you indicated, it's more of a, a linear type wound as opposed to a penetrating wound, if that, does that uh, make sense? It, it does, it, it, was a gl it was glancing, it kind of skidded, would be right. how I would think about it. But certainly it was at, is it, is it accurate to say that it was at such an angle that it still penetrated the skin a little bit, but as, as I think you've indicated, entered and exit. Yes, out. that is correct. Okay. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Doctor, you indicated that you were able to find a series of fragments as a, associated with this particular wound. Yes, uh, there were some fragments that were in the uh, skin of the scalp, and there were a couple more that were in the hair right around these two wounds. Okay. Thanks. Let's take a look at people's exhibit 20. Does that depict the same, the interior of that same wound? Yes, this is going to be after the uh, scalp has been uh, reflected away. And so the same kind of angle that we saw before where there was an entrance and an exit, this is the pattern that it made on the bone of the skull. Now, did, in, in you, you may have kind of already answered this, but I just want to ask a little bit more detailed question. So given the nature of the wounds that you've seen in the exterior and the interior, did this actually penetrate into the scalp or uh, skull itself? Uh, some portion may have, and definitely some sections of bone did. All right. Is that, I mean, it, it almost looks like a chip, if you will. Uh, yeah, but there's still an opening, and the the white in the center of that wound is brain matter, so there's a direct opening to the brain matter. All right. Now, People's Exhibit uh, 21. Give me one second here. But yes. These fragments, uh, it, uh, you talked about finding fragments. Yes. Uh, and what are we looking at in this photograph? Uh, these are the fragments that were collected from the hair around wounds A and B. We've got uh, the last witness here. We kind of went through this, but I want to just make sure we match it up. I don't know if you want gloves, Doctor. Are you Fine. good? Fine. All right. Fine. So I'm going to lay these out here.
Okay. Now, uh, just so we're clear on the record here, the envelopes with the blue tape are from where? My office. All right. So those are, when you collect evidence, uh, that's how you package it. Is that correct? Yes. All right. The color of tape may change, but yes. Now, obviously some other folks have examined some of this, this evidence, and we're going to see different tags. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we're looking at in People's 21, I believe, is, is this envelope right here, if I'm not mistaken. These, they've been taken out. Mm -hmm. This one. All right. So that envelope and those fragments match what we're seeing in uh, 21. Yes. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. All right. So I'm going to keep these here. Okay. And you, I think you indicated, just so that I, I have this clear, the, the wound path of this particular wound was more, uh, if I got it right, uh, left to right and front to back. Left to right, back to front, back to front and up. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. So let's move on to uh, wound C. Okay. Uh, I, actually, before we get to, get to that, the, I've also got this photograph and picture. I know you mentioned picking up something. Yes. Okay. What are we looking at? And this is People's Exhibit 22. So uh, there were also uh, projectile fragments from the scalp right adjacent to the bone uh, on that injury. And that's what this fragment is. So if we're, again, kind of matching, uh, that... Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So... That particular projectile is the one that you found inside the, between the, the uh, scalp and the skull, is that? Yes. Okay. All right. Now let's move to uh, wound C. Yes. Which is uh, People's Exhibit 24, I believe. Or is that D? That's D. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. I had to jumble some stuff around. Of course. Um, well, let's talk about wound D. Okay. Let's talk about wound D. First and foremost, doctor, um, did you find wound D right away? No, I did not. And, and uh, could you just describe that, please? Uh, in going through the scalp uh, and feeling and looking for wounds, there was a significant amount of blood. And so uh, wounds A, B, and C were readily identifiable and uh, when I started looking through them that's how they got shaved and we went forward uh, and then once that was done uh, I have to make an incision and start to reflect the scalp so I can see the bone underneath and that's when we start looking for more projectile fragments and indicators of wound direction and at that time I found a, another uh, opening or hole in the skull that did not match up with any of the previously seen scalp wounds. So at that time, we went through, my assistant and I, again, and found this small wound uh, that was uh, pretty heavily covered in blood. And uh, at that time, we uh, took photos of it and labeled it as wound D. Now, uh, could you describe for the jury where this wound is located on the head? Yes. So uh, this wound is going to be on the right side of the scalp. Uh, you can see in this photo the ear, so we're approximately above and a little bit behind the ear. And uh, in your internal examination, were you able to make any determinations as to potential uh, path and trajectory at this point? Yes. So uh, after looking at this wound and once again shaving the hair around it, I saw another little rim of abrasion, that marginal abrasion that is found with entrance wounds. And uh, pretty much directly across the skull and the musculature uh, just kind of behind and above the left ear, there was a projectile fragment. So the wound itself 
is on the right side. Yes. And the projectile is found on the left. Yes. Uh, again, were you able to make a determination as to the the path, if you will? Yes. Uh, this is going to go pretty much from right to left. There wasn't a lot of measurable distance either up or down or back or front. It's pretty straight across. And uh, exhibit 25, is that the fragment that you found on the left side? Or is that, no. did I get that screwed up? That's going to go with, so that one went with C. We'll get back to that. Yep, one. this one goes All with right. D. Sometimes I'm too smart for my own good, Doctor. All right, so this is People's Exhibit 26. Yes, sir. All right. And the fragment that you described <laughs> finding on the left side of Miss <laughs> Bletch's head is depicted in that particular exhibit. Is that accurate? That is correct. And I believe that is the same. Is that correct? It's this one. All right. And that goes with that. Yes. All right. Now, let's flip back and talk about uh, wound C. Describe to the jury where that was located. Yes, uh, that was going to be uh, also on the right side of the head, once again, more to the back side, this area. Uh, it, uh, when identified and the hair around it was shaved, also had a marginal abrasion, that little circle around that you find with entrance wounds. Uh, there's a corresponding hole in the skull, and uh, inside, uh, the, the brain a little deeper, uh, there was another projectile fragment, actually two projectile fragments. And you may have already shown the jury. So we have uh, the one wound A and B is on the sorry, left side. No, a right, and B is right. Right side? No, it is left. I'm sorry, now you're confusing right, me. Yes, it's left. back here on the left, yes. Wound C is on the right side? Yes. And wound D is it's on the right It's also on the right. And uh, based on your internal examination uh, on on where you found um, the fragment uh, and where the wound was, were you able to make a conclusion as to uh, the, the trajectory, the path of the wound? Of wound C? Yes. Wound yes. C. Uh, so wound C is basically going from back to front. And because of the rest of the brain, that, that's as much as I could tell. OK. And uh, you may have already told the jury this too, but where did you end up finding this particular fragment? Uh, there were two fragments, and they were within the actual substance or parenchyma of the brain tissue. And uh, approximately where in the head do you Oh, uh, that is on the x-ray, okay. and it, it gets very soft with the trauma, so the x-ray is going to be the better uh, item for that than anything else. All right, fair enough. So if I understand... Uh, Dr. Shaddock, when we we're talking about these, well, there's four wounds, but the, th the three uh, entrance wounds. Yes. Uh, the first one was more of a linear, and the last two were more um, straight. Uh, I would say angular and okay. straight on. Yes, one had an angle to it, and one appeared more straight on. The okay. other two, yes. Fair enough. Now, um, would, in, in your opinion, uh, given the, I want to talk about wound A and B for just a second. Okay. Uh, would that particular wound knock somebody down? It easily could, yes. Okay. So that, that, that wound was, is, 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 a, is one that if somebody were to get just that wound, it could incapacitate. It could. Uh, and certainly the other two, I think, speak for themselves as far as being able to in incapacitate somebody. Yes, they, any one of them could. All right. Now, uh, the, the, the significance of the black and blue eyes, you talked about that in your initial observation. Yes. Is there any correlation to, between that and the head trauma that... Yes. So besides just the uh, areas where the projectiles went into the skull, uh, there is a lot of force that comes with a projectile or a bullet. 
and that leads to more fractures in the skull, not just at the entrance or exit type sites. And so uh, there's a section of the base of the skull, we call it the middle crania fossa, it's kind of where your inner ears are, and then uh, there's a upper crania fossa right around the eyes. Uh, those bones had fractures, so any blood that was either around the brain, in the brain, instead of staying inside the skull, could have gone out through those fractures because those are the bones that are behind the cheeks and the, the eyes. All right. So essentially, the head, is it safe to say that the head trauma from these three projectiles ultimately is, is at least a cause, if not the cause, of why Rebecca's eyes were so black? Yes. All right. um, Doctor, are you familiar at all? Uh, in the, there's going to be some testimony later on in this case about finding some insulin. Uh, are you familiar at all with the effect of insulin on a person's body? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to object that. At this point, I think we're leaving the, uh, the parameters of uh, the expertise as qualified by this particular witness. Uh, I think at this point, uh, Well, can I explore that for just a second with her? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Judge. Um, I know we've talked a lot about what your specialty is and what you've been trained in, but yes. as part of that training, uh, does that include the effects? Uh, well, let me ask it this way. When you perform autopsies, uh, do you also do toxicology as part of that? I collect samples to send to a board-certified toxicology lab. Okay. Now, uh, as part of your training and or experience, uh, have you had to deal with the effects of drugs on a person's body? Yes. Uh, and I'm not going to list off all the drugs, but in general, uh, whether they be illegal, controlled substances, or prescribed controlled substances, as part of your training and education, have you learned how that affects a person's body? Yes. In and also, getting right down to it, uh, the effect of insulin on a person's body. Has that ever been part of your education, training, or experience? Yes. So is it safe to say, doctor, that in your training and education experience, you've learned about the effects of insulin on a person's body? Yes. Have you actually seen or been exposed to how insulin affects a person, uh, person's body? Yes. Judge, given that, I think she can render an opinion. What, well, you? Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Shannon, have you ever been qualified as an expert in toxicology? In toxicology, no. And, and it's your practice that, in fact, when questions of toxicology uh, arise, uh, those questions are sent off to a board-certified toxicologist. I don't quite understand the question. Okay. <laughs> you, you mentioned that when you have a person and you're examining him or her, yes. that you, you take samples, tissue samples, blood yes. samples, whatever, and those samples are sent off to a toxicologist for evaluation, is that correct? They are the ones that perform the actual assays to identify and quantify the substances. Okay, how's that different from a, a, a tox toxicological evaluation? Or is it? Well, it depends. Uh, a toxico uh, toxicologic evaluation, I know, they're all big words, uh, can, and it's not just getting and identifying the substance, it's also interpreting what the levels may mean. Okay, and that work is done when you send the samples off? Uh, no, they give us a number and an item, and they are available for consultation should the forensic pathologist need them. Okay. So they identify and quantify. Thank you. I'm going to yes. Your Honor, I renew my objection. Well, it sounds to me, are you going to ask her a question about what impact insulin may have had on the body of the deceased in this matter? No. Just in general. It'll be relevant, Judge. All right. Well, she has, she has indicated she's had training on the issue of the impact of insulin on the body, and so I'm going to allow her to testify. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, uh, all right, Doctor, just a couple of questions uh, before I finish up with you on that issue. Uh, the effect of insulin, uh, let, let's talk about a non-diabetic person. Okay. Uh, the effect of insulin on a non-diabetic, what, what, what could be the cause and effect of 
using or being uh, exposed to too much insulin? Okay, so uh, excess insulin uh, can lead to uh, low uh, circulating blood sugar or blood glucose, and in some cases that can make someone uh, nauseous. It can bring on some uh, discomfort, maybe they would sweat, feel jittery, and uh, if they do not have additional sugar added or if they had higher amounts of insulin, uh, they can also uh, become somewhere between unconscious to coma to death. And that's part of where my training comes in because there are people that have attempted or have succeeded in harming themselves by taking too much insulin. So the effect of, of having too much insulin with, without the supplements you've talked about could lead to incapacitation essentially unconsciousness, coma, and even in extreme cases, death. Depending upon the person's original level of blood sugar and how much insulin they received, yes. Right. And are there certain locations on the body where insulin works faster and slower? I am not actually aware of that. Okay, fair enough. I won't ask you that question. <laughs> I'll strike that. Um, thank you, doctor. I appreciate that. Now, uh, I asked you at the beginning, at looking at people's 156, uh, if that was the, the uh, extent and nature of your report, I think you answered yes to that. Yes, that is my report. The only other questions I have for you, uh, were you able to determine a cause of death in this particular uh, examination? Yes. And what was that? Multiple gunshot wounds at the head. And the manner of death was what, Doctor? Homicide. Uh, your Honor, I would move for the admission of People's 156, which is the autopsy report. No objection. Received. I have no further questions of Dr. Shadow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Being cross examined the witness, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Shack. I don't know yes. if I introduced myself the last time. I'm Fred Johnson. Good yes, afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Dr. Shack, you, you've got a number of bullet fragments there yes. and, and bullets. Just the easiest way to refer to them sure. uh, in front of you, and they're all nice and neatly packaged uh, in front of you. Uh, and, and and you have to forgive me for this question because the only insight I have into what you do is what I see on TV. So of I course. forgive us. When when the when the autopsy is being performed on, the, on TV, the, the the doctor's always that usually he's smoking, uh, and he's standing there and he ah here's a bullet ticket and he drops it into a, a, a metal pan and it clinks around. Okay. And here. They're all segregated. Yes. When you remove these fragments uh, from this bletch at the time, were they also segregated or did they go into a larger receptacle and then segregated later? Oh no, they're always kept separate. Oh. So when they come out, they are rinsed to remove blood, photographed, and then placed into individual uh, envelopes. These are, uh, they're, they're besides these envelopes, um, there can be gauze or occasional items like that, and they are set aside one after another, and then I will go through and close and sign. Then when we find the next, so on and so forth. My assistants um, will help with uh, rinsing, labeling, and taping. How do you make sure you don't mix them up? I mean, because you, you, you I'm, I'm, let me rephrase because that, sure. that was important. How do you remember which? portion was taken where if you're sitting are you writing them down as this occurs or? that is correct right. so as we go along I will have to either stop and change gloves or if my assistants blood uh, gloves are not bloody they will uh, label them as we go out and they get separate little plastic containers I believe they're the urine containers if anybody's ever had to give a urine sample uh -huh. we have those so we will keep them lined up and separate thank you uh, you mentioned a, no, a number of trauma that Ms. Blush suffered. Did, did you find any injection points? In other words, did you find any points on her body that where it indicate where it would be indicative of a hypodermic needle and, and puncturing her skin? No, I did not. And did you look for those? Do you look for those things? Yes, I do. Okay. And did you look in this occasion? Yes, I did. All right. Um, you mentioned the the uh, the uh, discoloration and abrasion and contusions, etc. Um, were any of those, I, I guess, trauma? I guess they're those, all. I would define them all as trauma. Okay. Were any of those trauma caused by uh, circumstances that you could not attribute to 
uh, one to the bullets, or two to the examinations, three to the rescue efforts. I, I'm, I'm understanding they perform CPR. Uh, mm -hmm. Or four, the, the force of a fall she may have taken uh, at the time of the incident. I'm counting three or four things. I have them all correct. Uh, the injuries that I saw uh, could all be consistent with gunshot wounds and an ensuing fall if one were to fall forward okay. or onto their side. Okay. And you didn't find anything in addition to, the, to those four causes that I outlined, did you? Okay. Well, I can I, go over them again. If I no, know. it's just that there, there was no wound caused by the examination. Okay. But I, that's, that's fine. Uh, doctor, did you find any um, uh, gunpowder residue on the person who was <clears throat> No, but I would not expect to either. Uh, her hair, what I, as we get back to her hair, being long and thick and full of blood, uh, any type of uh, evidence such as gunpowder or soot uh, would easily be absorbed by her hair and possibly washed away by blood. So uh, that's why I, I cannot give a range of fire on these wounds uh, and that the blood it may have been there, it may not have. All I can say is that there was blood. Okay, that's, that's, I, I want to talk about that for a little bit. Sure. It's, first of all, explain to, to when I talk about gunpowder, uh, mm -hmm. boom, gunpowder, president. Yes. Correct. Uh, this is, this is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you, you commonly find it where there are gun, you can find it where there are gunshot wounds, correct? You can. And, and this is when a bullet's fired, mm -hmm. it expels hot gunpowder as well, correct? It can be ash, mm -hmm. hot gunpowder, burning gunpowder, or unburned gunpowder. All of those things, plus uh, heated gases and the projectile come out the end of the, the weapon. And the, the distance that spray, let's call it that, that gunpowder residue, that gunpowder spray, is different depending on the, 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 the gun or the weapon used to produce it, correct? And the uh, type of ammunition, both factors. Weather, all that stuff. Weather, is it, weather, well, I, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know much about weather, okay. but 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 the, the spray can be different, and the spray it can be narrow or it can be a wide spray. Correct. That can help you with distances. Yes. Okay. So, uh, how is it that you're uh, you're excluding the possibility that the spray of this gun? Um, some of the gunpowder residue didn't wind up on either her face or her clothing. Because when it was there, I looked for it, okay. and it either could have been there and was lost in transfer or may not have been there. And sometimes the gunpowder itself is red hot, it's very hot, correct? It can be. And it can actually burn into the skin if it, if it, if it, if it, if I'm shot and it gets on my skin, it can actually burn into the skin, correct? Yes, that's called stippling. I could never, I couldn't come up with that word, stippling. Thank you. Did you notice any stippling? I did not. Okay. None on your skin? None, uh, none on your skin? No, blood. once again, all of the wounds were covered by hair. So had there been any of those types of hot pieces of gunpowder, uh, they would typically be absorbed by the hair and would not leave a mark on the skin. Will you point to to your, the, I, I think it's bullet, the, the bullet D, the one that went over by the ear, can you point to that, where that went in? Roughly, yeah, approximately here. Okay, all right. So, um, a bullet, and the other location for the other bullets was? So C uh -huh. is back here, uh -huh. and then A and B are roughly back here. Okay. Did you? You examined the body, correct? Yes. You did not examine the clothing? I photographed the clothing and package it as evidence. So at the time that I'm looking at it, I'm looking for large uh, things that say projectile fragments, just like the things found in the hair. At that time, I look for those items, and if I see anything such as gunpowder or soot, I will make a note of it, mm -hmm. but I do not do the final analysis. I just document, photograph what I see, if there's anything that's small and needs to be removed, I will take it off and package it separately. And then beyond that, I pass everything, including any of those pieces, off to the investigating law enforcement agency. So if a stippling 
is in the clothing, but is small, you're not going to do that kind of close evaluation, are you? No, I do not do that processing. Okay. And do you know if uh, Mrs. Bletch's hair was down as yours is or re pulled back or restrained in any way uh, with, at the time that she was shot? I, I don't know. I know by the time that she got to me, there was a hair tie in place, but hair was also loose. And so I don't know when in the course prior to her coming to me that happened. I'm sorry, there was a hair tie at some point? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes? And bobby pins, yes. Okay. okay. Hair tie and bobby pins. So would you show again that, what is that, the entrance room for the one behind the ear? It's above. Okay. No, the one behind the ear. Right, right here. Okay. Yeah, my ear's right here. Better. Yeah. You'll do me one better. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, by the time she got to you, her hair was down and over her face. Uh, in portion of uh, in her face, I wouldn't say over, but around in, okay. in her face. Had her hair been pulled back at the time of the shooting? Had it been pulled back and not down as yours is? That would have exposed more of her skin, would it not? It could have, yes. And if more of her skin had been exposed, mm -hmm. then more of her skin exposed to stippling. If there was any at all, there's okay. a higher possibility. Bottom line is you didn't find any stippling. I did not. And had you found stippling, what would that have indicated to you? Uh, that would indicate to me that the uh, at least the wound that had the stippling would have been at a close to uh, intermediate range. And you mentioned, and I think it was the gunshot. First of all, you, these gunshot wounds that you discussed are labeled A, B, C, and D. Yes. Is there any correlation to when the guns, the gunshot wounds occurred and those letters? In other words, oh, the no, A, no, okay. it's the order in which I found them. Okay. Are, were you able to tell which gunshot wound was received first? No. Were you able to come to a conclusion as to which gunshot wound was the fatal one? No. Would A and B, A or A, B have been fatal, in your opinion? I have seen wounds like A and B be fatal. Okay. Do you think, well, do you have any opinion as to whether it was on this occasion? I don't. One moment, please. Of course. I want to make sure that, that there's any um, misunderstanding. You're not, we're not talking about four wounds here. We're talking about three wounds and, and, and one was a, the same bullet causing two a break, two. So I will say that there are three entrance wounds, but Thank there you. are a total of four gunshot wounds. Thank you. Yes. Were you able to uh, make any determined, uh, um, make it, when you perform the autopsy, yes. did you um, look for evidence of a sexual assault? Yes, I did. And what were your conclusions of that? That there was no obvious trauma to the external genitalia. And did you come to a conclusion as to whether or not there was a sexual assault or not? All I can say is that there was no obvious trauma to any of the genitalia, but uh, swabs and samples were collected and passed off to law enforcement. Okay. Do you know whether or not Ms. Bletcher was diabetic? I do not. And nothing, you didn't take any, you didn't, you didn't look? That's not part of your... No, I, whatever was made available to me, I have no knowledge of her being seen for diabetes. Okay, and you didn't, you, that's not part of what you do, you didn't look for that? Well, I look for her medical records. Okay, thank you. Nothing further. Just a couple of follow-up, Judge if I may. All right. Uh, doctor, you ever heard the term normal is normal? I don't actually in think the, that I have. <laughs> in the, in the, in, I guess a bad question. In the context of sexual assault, normal okay. being normal. In other words, is it, it in sexual assault cases, is it normal to not find trauma versus finding trauma? Oh. Uh, it's going to depend on 
the circumstances of the assault. Uh, I am aware of uh, victims who fight back and can have significant trauma, and I am aware of victims who either do not fight back or are uh, unable to fight back and who may not have trauma. It all depends upon the circumstances that surround that individual assault. So uh, just kind of piggybacking off of your answer there, if somebody is incapacitated, let's say, uh, and is, doesn't have the ability to fight back, is it more likely or less likely to find trauma? Objection, Your Honor. Uh, I think we have to do foundation that that sort of information is available anywhere to anyone. Uh, I think the, the question is so broad as to ask for this witness to ask come to a conclusion that's well beyond anybody's expertise. I, I, I just don't, I, I think the question is too broad and there has to be a foundation that she would have that. She just answered the question that way, Judge. If, I, if my memory serves me correct, and I could be wrong, but she indicated that she has seen cases where victims fight and there is trauma, and she's seen cases where victims are not unable to fight and there is no trauma. That was her answer prior to my The question is if you're unable to fight back. Is it more likely or less likely to find trauma? I'll allow her to answer the question. Thank you. I have seen both uh, trauma and not trauma when you are unable to fight back. Uh, my experience in that is somewhat limited. So in the cases that I've seen uh, where people were unable to fight back, there has been less trauma, but I have seen trauma when people have been incapacitated also. All right. Now, I just want to clarify on wound D. Yes. Uh, in here, let's flip. When you were first testifying about wound D under my questioning, uh, is wound D the one that you did not see on your initial external examination? It is. So uh, it wasn't visible to your eye on your initial look over before you did uh, the, the incisions and the whatnot? That is correct. And if I understand correctly, wound D, you didn't find that until you actually got a chance to look at the scalp itself. The skull. The yes. skull, excuse me. The skull. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Any last questions? Um, sure. Dr. Shapley, um, did, do you, did, were you able to collect any evidence of incapacitation prior to the gunshot wounds? No. Um, and, and you performed basically what Lady would call a, a rape kit on the victim. Is that correct? Uh, sexual assault examination, yes. And you collected evidence and passed and passed that on to whoever reviews that sort of thing. Is that correct? Law enforcement, yes. Thank you. Okay, okay. doctor. Thank you. You may stand now. Thank you. Your Honor, I can't. And I'll, I apologize because uh, I didn't write it down in my notes. Did I officially admit Exhibit One Fifty Six for yeah. autopsy report? Did. I did. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will take a 10 minutes of uh, recess here and we'll go to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. People of the state of Michigan call Susan Mosley to the stand.
Please raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Yes, I do. You have a seat. State your name for the record. Susan Elliott Mosley. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Mosley. Hi. Uh, we're, I, I want to do this. Um, back in 2013, in particular, in April of 2013, where were you working? Macaulay. And uh, what shift did you work? Seconds and thirds, mostly. Sometimes I had some first shifts as now, well. But back on April 26th of 2013, were you working that particular day or, I guess, night? Second shift. All right. And second shift was from when to when? Uh, 2 to 10, but the nurses get an extra half hour for reports, so you get out anywhere between 10 and 10.30 if you're lucky. Okay. <laughs> Understandable. Now, uh, on the 26th of April in 2013, uh, did you work that particular night? Yes. Did, 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 did I just ask you that question? I, I, I think you might have just asked me that right, question, but I, I apologize. Uh, better question. On that particular night, after you finished your shift, do you remember stopping at the Exxon station, which is located off of uh, Sternberg? And, and Absolutely. Okay. And do you recall, ma'am, why uh, you were stopping at the Exxon station that particular night after your shift? Yes, I had to buy a lighter. Now, I don't know if you recall approximately what time it was when you uh, went to the station that particular <coughs> night. Do you? It would have been between 10.30 and probably 10 to 11 is my guess okay. uh, with my out time. I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 157. Uh, it is a, I guess, could you describe for the jury what that is, please? It's a receipt for a Bic lighter at 1051. All right. And uh, again, I don't know if you recall or not if you bought a Bic lighter that night, but is that the receipt uh, for the lighter you bought? I'm sure. Okay. I'm sure. Now, it also indicates who served you. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. it, is that a yes? Oh, yes. Okay. And who, who was the cashier that uh, sold you that big lighter? It was Jessica Heringa. Now, prior to April 26th of 2013, uh, had you been to that station before? Yes. And did, did you know, I mean, maybe not personally, but you, did, did you know Jessica? Uh-huh, she would wait on me quite a bit. Okay. She worked evenings. So no mistake in that on... Oh, no mistake, and we on, talked okay. that night. On that night, mm -hmm. at 1052, it was Jessica that sold you No that. mistake. Okay. Yep. Now, um, approximately how long, Ms. Mosley, did you stay in the store, do you think? I'm going to go with about a minute and a half to two minutes. It wasn't very long. Um, and the reason that I know that is because my daughter was late picking me up, and so I was irritated, and so I did not shop for candy or ice cream, which I normally did. All right. Fair so enough. I know that it was quick, and I remember Jessica saying, no ice cream or anything tonight, and I said, oh, no. Okay. Going straight home. Uh, from the time frame that you were in the store and the interaction you had with Miss Herring, uh, did you notice anything unusual or no. sense anything that was wrong? Nope. Nope. She was in a good mood and um, absolutely nothing. All right. Now, was there anybody else in the store at the time? That Not in the store, no. All right. Anybody else at the pumps or anything? That you're there doing? was a car. I couldn't tell you what kind except for it was like maybe a four-door, I'm going to go with Honda type sedan type car they were pumping gas they were leaving okay other than that nobody else around nope and uh after you bought the lighter did you exit the store yes and and leave yes fair enough thank you miss mosley i have nothing else miss mosley good afternoon hi my name is fred johnson hi fred uh, um, hi. just a couple quick questions you you frequented the store i had frequented the store um Yes, we're going to go with that. I hadn't been in there for uh, several weeks prior to that, but yes. But you figured it off enough so Miss Herringa knew who you were. Oh, and yes. Who she was oh, yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, were you aware of whether or not there were security cameras in that store? No, I, I wouldn't have you wouldn't know known anything. Of or not? No. Thank you. I don't have anything for present. Thank you. You may stand down, ma'am. Your next witness, please. Uh, Judge, uh, before I forget, I'm going to move to admit People's Exhibit 157. No objection. That is what? That is the uh, receipt for the lighter. Okay. Be 
received. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. You swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I hope you God, yes. Please have a seat. State your name for the record. Craig Harpster. Could you spell the last name, Mr. Harpster, real quick? H-A-R-P-S-T-E-R. Mr. Harpster, uh, who do you work for? GE Aviation. And uh, back on April 26, 2013, were you still working for, or were you working for, GE Aviation? Yes, I was. And uh, back then, back in 2013, what shift did you work, sir? Second shift. And what hours did that encompass? 3 p.m. till 11 p.m. Now, uh, did you have a, I won't say normal routine, but an occasional routine on Fridays after work where you might stop? I needed gas that evening. I know for a fact that, you know, I was on, my light was on. Okay. And uh, from... GE or from GE Aviation, was there a, a, a gas station that you frequented uh, if you needed gas? Yes, it was the Exxon station at Sternberg. Okay. It's the closest one. Now, uh, on the 26th of April, 2013, uh, did you work your normal shift? Yes, um, 3, 3 p.m. till 11 p.m. And when I say 11 p.m., we punch out at 11 exactly. So no, is there any doubt in your mind that you left at 11 p.m. that night? Not a one. Okay. Uh, and uh, approximately how long does it take you to get from uh, GE Aviation to the Exxon station? I've redone it many, many times. Um, seven minutes at the max. All right. And on the 26th of April, 2013, uh, did you, you, I think you indicated you went to the Exxon right after you, you clocked out from work? It, 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 right after, yeah. I, the light was on, I knew I needed gas, and I went right there. Okay. Uh, when you arrived at the gas station, uh, did you see anybody else either getting gas? Uh, let's talk about the outside. Did you see anybody else outside, anybody getting gas at that point? In time? No. No. I was the only one. I pulled up to the pump. Okay. What would you do next? I went to pay with cash. I did, wasn't using a credit card, so I turned the pump on, and it needed to be activated and it didn't. Okay, so what'd you do? Looked around and, you know, lights on in the store and everything, and so um, I went inside. And uh, when you walked inside the store, what'd you do? Hollered, hey, um, anybody here? Uh, there was a car in front, uh, only one that, that I saw, and I, no answer, no response. Okay. Um, did you look around the store? I went inside, yes. I even checked in the bathroom. Um, they had an L-shaped cooler. I walked inside there, looked inside there. Um, went into the back room. I, I was talking time, you know, the whole time saying, hey, is anybody here? And did it appear to you at all, Mr. Harpster, uh, was there any disturbance? I mean, did it appear as though things were out of place or Things have been disheveled in some manner? Not, not that I saw, no. Okay. Uh, now, um, I guess, what do you do next? Thought about leaving, but I just had a gut feeling something wasn't right, and I dialed 911. Okay. Um, sit tight here. I'm going to play for you. <coughs> First, before I continue, you recognize that voice? That's me. That's you? Yeah. Okay. Road, kind of Haven. 
and there's nobody here. Um, it wouldn't allow me to pump gas, but I had to walk inside. There's nobody. There's a car here. There's a, another car out in front. But it, it, it's very suspicious, but there's nobody here. Okay, so did you yell or anything? Or? Yeah, I hollered, hey, hey, you know, walked around the building. It's just, um, I don't know. It's, Yes, it is. Okay. Um, I want to have you take a look. I apologize, jurors. I, this is just be a quick picture. This is uh, the People's Exhibit 31. You had mentioned seeing a car uh, parked when you walked in. Is that the car that you saw? I believe, yes, it is. Now, you also described on the 911 call uh, a Honda. Uh, seeing a Honda. Yeah. Remember where that was located? That would have been more towards the car wash, um, towards Sternberg Road, quite a bit farther up. Okay. So not not in the I guess nearest vicinity of the the convenience store station, but <coughs> near the car wash, which I think is an external building. Yes. Further away. Yes. Okay. And I don't know. Did you ever see who belonged to that vehicle as you were standing out there? Uh, just high school kids who were taking pictures of the train coming for their yearbook. Ah, okay. Did, um, did you know who Jessica Herringer was? I had met her. I had been in the store. I didn't know her personally, no. Okay. Uh, that's a great answer to kind of a bad question. Um, but you knew what, what she looked like and, mm -hmm. and kind of who she was, but didn't know her personally. Mm-hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, I'm sorry. And she wasn't there, obviously, when you were there, because no one was there. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harpster. I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Harpster. Hello, sir. My name is Fred Johnson. I'd like to ask you a couple questions on my name. Mm -hmm. Mr. Harpster, did, did you know, did you ever meet 
person by the name of Rebecca Blanchard? Not on the inside of the store. Okay, but not in the back. Did you walk around the back of the store? No. Okay. So would you know if there was a light on in the back or not? A light on? In the back in the back of the store. Mm. Do you have recollections? No. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I have no further questions. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm good. All right, thank you, sir. You may stand down. Next witness, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I will let the jurors know we'll be using the TV screen again, so. Uh, people call Susan Follett to the stand. <coughs> Please raise your right hand. Do you swear that testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Please have a seat. State your name for the record. Susan Follett. Ms. Follett, could you just spell your last name for the record so we get it right? F-O-L-L-E-T-T. -T. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with uh, April 26, 2013. First, first question, back, back at that time, uh, were you employed? Yes. And where were you working? Sternberg Exxon. Now, what shift did you normally work at the Sternberg Exxon? First. And that included what hours? 5 a.m. or just before 5 a.m. until about noonish. Okay. Uh, and was that your typical shift? Yes. Now, on the 26th of April, uh, 2013, uh, around the 11 o'clock hour, 11 p.m., uh, were you out and about that particular night? Yes. Okay. And what were you doing? Riding my motorcycle. Okay. Now, uh, were you riding alone or were you, with, were you riding with someone else? My ex-husband. And what is his name? Eric Barber. Okay. And uh, were you coming, Where I guess, where were you coming from? Uh, Henry, down Sternberg, toward the gas station. Okay. Uh, East End Sternberg. Was there any particular reason why you were dri riding your bike in that direction? Um, we had went toward downtown, and I always like to take a certain route, but we went the opposite way instead of the normal way. And my mom lives down that road, and I really like riding on Sternberg, and... It was just the way that I went. Okay. Now, uh, at some point in time, do you get to the intersection of Sternberg and Old Grand Haven? Yes. Okay. Now, um, if, if you look behind you, oh, we'll look behind uh -huh. you. You can see I've got a map up here. I'm going to have you stand up here in just a second. Okay. Um, what What are we looking at, Miss? Um, Exxon and Sternberg Road and. The little mall area behind. Okay, could you point out just just in case the jurors need to know where the Exxon station is? Right there. All right. Now, uh, I, and I don't know if this is part of the Exxon station or not, but is there like a car wash or something of that nature? Yeah, that's right there. Okay. Now, uh, in the little mall area is where? Back right there. Okay. Now, as you uh, crossed through the intersection of Sternberg and Old Grand Haven Road and made your way, um, I gotta make sure I get my directions right here, you'd be going east on Sternberg. Uh, did something catch your attention? Yeah, the gray minivan. Okay, and where did you see the minivan as you were traveling on East Sternberg Road? In this drive right there, driving. All right. Same and so you're, you're pointing, just, I, I have to just make sure I describe it for the record. So you're pointing towards the service drive that runs between Sternberg and uh, the, the Centerpoint Mall. Correct. Okay. 
And was there any particular reason why that caught your attention at that point? No. Okay. As you are traveling east, in what direction is this minivan traveling? East. Same kind of, you guys are riding parallel? Just about. All right. And um, do you see this minivan at some point in time get to or make it to the Exxon station? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Could you describe, could you describe that please? Um, just as I was passing this drive, he was pulling in. I have no idea about what speed I was going. I know I was going a little bit slower. And then just as he had passed the back of the gas station, we were also passing the gas station. And the lights on the van turned off and that made me sicker to my stomach. So I knew something wasn't right. All right, well, let's stop there for just a second so we can describe Thank you. this. So you're traveling eastbound on East Sternberg. You see uh, the van uh, go, go down. I guess that service road goes, not only goes east and west, but then goes north and south by the Exxon station. Is that right? Correct. So you see the van coming essentially towards you or south. Correct. Now, does it, I, I guess, could you describe for the jury as you're passing the station, does it, where does it pass? Uh, is it, it, I guess, where does it pass the, the convenience store, the station park, the van? I guess. Just as soon as the van crossed the back of the gas station, it did a U-turn toward the road. So I was able to watch the lights flip off and then do a U-turn back toward the gas station. Okay. So did the van then go, when the lights were turned off, did it go in front of the station or behind the station? Behind the station. All right. Now, uh, obviously you continue on East Sternberg, is that correct? Correct. What happens next? We got to Harvey and I said to my ex-husband, I said, I'm going back, something's not right. And he said, okay. And we turned around in the belt tire parking lot and when I went back, we had pulled in to this drive. All right, so now we're talking about the service drive. The, I'll call it the north-south service drive just uh, to the side of the Exxon station. Is that what you're talking about? Correct. All right, and in what direction do you go? We go north. Okay. And just as I was passing this, the back of the station right about here, I looked over and I, I seen the van. All right. And I could see movement back there, but I couldn't see what was going on. It was dark. Now, I want to stop you right there for just a second. The, uh, obviously you're, you're familiar with both the inside and the outside of the Exxon station. Correct. And this van where it was parked, I mean, was it, was the front of the van, uh, I guess in line with the back of the station or how, how was it parked? It was it was far enough up to where when he got into the driver's door he was lit up from the side lights of the building. Okay. So I, I guess my the other question I have for you is, is so is the the nose of the, the van itself is that out, is it in front of the corner of the building or is it with the corner or behind the corner? You understand what I'm asking you? It's where I could see the van from up here, out on the road. Okay. The van was further, not directly behind the, the station, I guess. So as you're... Some of it was sticking out so I could see it. Okay. Thank you. Now, you make your way north on that service road. Do you, do you stay there or do you go somewhere else? No, we then went west on the back service road and pulled into the parking lot. And, and I know that there's a little bit of distance here, but could you kind of point approximately where you parked your motorcycle? I can't reach that high. Okay. Like there. All right. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, the, if we divide the, the parking lot, if you will, in, in half, were you at the lower half or the upper half? Lower half. Lower half. More towards the, the 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 middle point. You understand what I'm asking you? Kind of a bad question. Um, 
I would say I'm in the, uh, it'd be the east south corner. Okay. Now, uh, from Thank you, Tom. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was like right about there ish. Thank you. Okay. Now, where you are parked, uh, can you still see behind the Exxon station? Yes. And uh, is the van still there? Yes. Is it still in its same position? Yes. Now, uh, could you see anything going on behind the van? Um, not necessarily. It was dark. Okay. What I did see was a light on the back hatch of the van. Okay. And it came down and immediately came back up and went back down. Okay. So, when you, if I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're parked, and is the hatch up at that point? Um, you know, I couldn't say. All right. I didn't notice anything until I seen the light coming down. Okay. So, you see the light coming down, and then immediately come back up? Correct. And then, does it immediately come back down? or? What yeah, point? it immediately goes back down. Okay, what happens next? Um, the, the man walked to the driver's door and got in and drove away like the vehicle was already started because it was just so quick. Were the, when you're parked there, were, are the headlights still on or are they off? They were off. All right. Uh, do you remember at what point in time, or I should ask you this, do the headlights ever come back on? Yeah, it was like as soon as he got in the van, like the van started rolling, the lights came on. Okay. I mean, it was quick. And now that you got the pointy stick there, it makes it a little bit easier. It, where does this van go? He left back here and went north and followed this way. And we started our bikes and he was passing through somewhere and we came we were about right here, and he passed right in front of my headlights. All right. So just for the record, for the record's sake, uh, essentially at some point in time, as the van is going now west on that second service road, uh, you guys sort of meet at the what I'll call the pretty close to the second north-south service drive. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Now. Um, how many people did you see in the van? One. And uh, where was that person located? In the driver's seat. Did you see anybody in the passenger seat? No. Did you see anybody or anything or any anybody moving in either the back seat or the, the way back of the van? No. Uh, what do you do next, Ms. Pollock? I pulled out behind him and just he turned right under Graniam Road and I turned left. Okay. Um, and again. Fuck. For, uh, for the record, oh, take your time. There's some Kleenex right here if you need it. Just let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. So just so I understand, could you point what service drive your motorcycle and that van end at before the you part ways? Right here. Right there? Okay. So it's the end of the east-west uh, service drive. You indicated the van turns in what direction? North, right. Okay. Going north on Old Grand Haven? Correct. And you go? South. South? Okay. Now, um, I, I apologize, I forgot to ask you one question. The, obviously you worked at the Exxon station, you're familiar with it. Is, is there any back service door to the, to the station? There is. And, and, and how many back service doors are there? One. One? And, and approximately, do you know where that is? It, 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 Directly. In the middle. In the middle? Yep. So where this van was parked, is, is the van parked in front of that service door or behind it? No. 
It would have been part to the west of the service door. So, so okay, that, another good answer to a bad question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I will correct you, buddy. <laughs> uh, no, I appreciate that. Uh, this van is parked. Um, well, I, 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 there's a way to West of the service door or east of the service door? West. Okay, thank you. Um, do you remember at all what, or did you see any any articles of clothing? On the man, yeah. Yeah, what did you see? Bright red shirt. Bright red shirt. Long sleeves. Okay. I'm going to show you a series of three photographs. People's Exhibit 158. I want you to take a look at that. In, in 159, in 160. Uh, those those photographs. Is that consistent with what you remember seeing that particular night at the van? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, when you turn south on uh, old. Grand Haven Road, yeah, south. Uh, where were you going? Home. And uh, when you, how soon were you home, or how long, or what time period elapsed when you were home when you got a phone call? It was just minutes after I got home that we got a phone call. Okay. It wasn't very long. And who was the phone call from? My old boss, Fred Seaman. All right. And um, obviously that caused you to leave your house? Yeah. Where'd you go? Back to the gas station. All right. Now, I, I don't know if you recall this, but do you recall approximately what time it was when you first passed through the intersection of uh, Old Grand Haven and Sternberg Road? No idea. Okay. It was nighttime though, right? It was night. Um, as you pass by the, uh, uh, let me ask you this question, as you pass by the uh, gas station, did you notice any vehicles in the parking lot? Jessica's was there. Just Jessica's? And the van, yeah. Okay. Any other vehicles? No. no. Um, No. Thank you. I'm going to be further questions. Thank you. You stand down. Uh, you're on a people state of Michigan call Corporal Joel Hooksma to the stand. Please raise your right hand. You swear that testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Have a seat. State your name for the record. Joel Hooksima. 
Good afternoon. Hello. Um, I want to direct your attention to April 26, 2013. Uh, were you on duty that day? I was. And uh, I should say probably around the 11 o'clock hour. I apologize. Were you on duty around the 11 o'clock hour? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you recall being dispatched to the Exxon station off of Sternberg? I do. Now, uh, initially the dispatch was for what reason? Uh, s suspicious situation. There was nobody there. Okay. And uh, that Exxon station, is that located here in Stephen County? It is. Now, uh, when you got there, do you remember uh, either running into or talking to a gentleman by the name of Craig Harvester? I don't know if you saw him or not. Honestly, I didn't really speak to very many people while on the scene. I was just dealing with the scene. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, when you walked inside the store, Corporal, what did you see? All the lights was on. All the lights in the store were on. Music was playing. Everything was normal. Um, absent, you know, everything was normal with the exception of no employee on scene. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you here some photographs. First photograph is People's Exhibit 28. Uh, what are we looking at here? That's the back door of the gas station from the inside looking. And is that kind of how it appeared to you that particular night? It is. It appears in this photo that the door is propped open slightly. As I recall that night when I responded, the door was closed. Okay. Now, uh, did you notice or observe any signs of a struggle or any of that, any disturbance, anything disturbed? No. The next uh, photo is People's Exhibit 29. What are we looking at in that photograph? That is the cash drawer sitting on top of a safe, uh, kind of in a back room area of the store. Now, th is this uh, is this uh, particular Exxon or this particular gas station, is it a 24-hour gas station? Or does it have an, an open and closed time? It has an open and closed time. It wasn't open 24 hours. And do you recall at all the time it closed at night? I don't know the time it closed. I don't remember. Now, this drawer, uh, I guess, and I don't know if you if you were asked to, but uh, did it look, did it appear as if any of that money had been disturbed at all? It looked normal to me, as it does in the photo there, um, just as an employee would use it. Didn't, nothing appeared to be rifled through. There wasn't bills sticking out at odd angles or anything like that. All right. Now, uh, outside of that, uh, did you discover any personal property? I did. What was it that you discovered? Uh, I found a, a purse and a jacket in that back room area as well. So this is uh, People's Exhibit 30, uh, kind of more of an expanded view of the back room. Is that safe to say? Yes. And uh, I see there's a coat in this, in this picture. Is that the coat you're talking about? Yes, the purple coat hanging on the, the shelving unit there. Did you happen to determine or find out or, or did that purse contain any identification? The purse sitting on the, the boxes there um, we determined belonged to Jessica Herringa. And uh, do you recall, uh, did that purse have any personal items in it? I personally didn't open the, the purse and I don't recall. I mean, I know it was determined to be Ms. Herringas, but I don't recall specifically how. Fair enough. Uh, any other personal property? Not that I recall. All right. Outside the station, uh, People's Exhibit 31, uh, what is this a photo of? Uh, it looks to be a photo of a, a Mercury sedan. Do you know this to be the car of Jessica, or was it determined to be Jessica Herringas' car? I don't know that. I My uh, area was in the back of the gas station. I didn't deal with any of the cars up front. Okay. Fair enough. Let's talk about the back. You indicated that, it, or maybe you didn't, uh, but is there only one door that gets you from the inside of the store to the back of the store, or outside the back of the store? That's correct. And uh, what are we looking at in this particular photograph, which is People's Exhibit 31? 32. 32. Uh, that's the back door of the gas station um, that we had previously identified looking from the inside. This is looking from the outside. And. Um, Ms. Ms. Follett had testified that that door kind of splits the store in two, I mean, it's halfway uh, on either either end. Is that what you recall? Yeah, that would be accurate. Okay. Now, uh, did you find anything of particular interest in the back 
I did. What, what was that? Uh, multiple items, including uh, two small batteries, um, a, a, a battery cover for a laser sight, as well as some blood. All right. I'm get to that here in just a second. This photograph, People's Exhibit uh, 33, is uh, what are we looking at here? Uh, the back of the store again, looking towards the west. Um, the back door can be seen right on the left side of the the frame of the f picture. And I don't, can you, can you see in this particular photograph the, the laser sight cover? Yes. Uh, you got a stick in front of you, a pointer. You can point it out. It's this little black shape right there. Okay, and I don't, I know the, the batteries are, are, are quite small, and I don't know if you remember uh, in relationship to the, the laser sight cover where the batteries were found. Can't say with absolute certainty, but they're in the general vicinity of the battery. I mean, they're so small that I don't know if they would show up in the photo. Okay, fair enough. Let's uh, look at people's exhibit before we What are we looking at in this particular? Uh, it's a closer-up photo of the items that I had found, including the battery cover, the batteries, and the blood. All right, if you could point out uh, all of those, please. The battery cover right here, you can see the white label on it. One battery right there, second battery right there, and then the blood. Okay. Now, um, could you describe for the, and, I, and I'm assuming, uh, Corporal Hosma, that did you collect those items? I did. And could you describe for the jury how you collected the blood? I used. Um, it's essentially a, a long Q-tip, a um, little cotton swab on the end. We wet the blood with some purified water, swab the Q-tip in it, and then take the Q-tips and package it in very small evidence boxes, which ultimately gets sent to the lab. Start with uh, People's Exhibit 161. Could you describe what's in that package, please? It's not open. Oh. Uh, it's a laser battery cover. And uh, that's the, in that package contains a laser battery cover that's in, the exhibit, uh, in that photograph. That's correct. 162. Two watch batteries. And again, uh, that package contains the two watch batteries that are in, in uh, that, this photograph that's being displayed right now, People's Exhibit uh, 34. That's correct. And finally, uh, 163. Is that the blood stain? Yeah, we have two things, two packages. The top one is three blood stains, and then the bottom one says toothbrush belonging to victim. Um, and that is, you, as you described to the jury, taken from that bloodstain found at the scene. Correct. All right. Now, I believe, let's check here. We'll look at People's Exhibit 36. <laughs> that is, what are we looking at in that photograph? That's the battery cover from the laser site. And uh, it, does it indicate a potential manufacturer? Yeah, it does. What's that? Carl Walther. Okay. 
And uh, do you recall doing any uh, investigation on that? Essentially, I just did an internet search of that um, product. All right. And what? that it was a laser sight um, made specifically for a Carl Walther pistol. And uh, any of those numbers on there allow you to tie it to any specific particular laser sight or handgun that you're aware of? I don't recall any um, specific, just that it was specific to that manufacturer of handguns. condition that you found it on the night in question? Yes, as I recall, the lights were on. Okay, and you did not, you know for sure you didn't turn them on? That's correct. Okay, and and also in the back of that store, it appears to be a, uh, a gray door. Do you recall? We do put up 31 or 32. There you go, the door. Yes. You see, that? you see the door I'm referring to? Yes. Uh, does that door have a, uh, a door handle on the outside? It does not. Okay. Is, do you, I see it's, it's, it's open there. Did you did you open that door and come out through there, or did you walk around the building? I went through that door. Okay, so there's a handle on the other side? There's a, a crash bar to push open, yes. Oh, one of those bars that goes along? Yes. Okay. Do you know whether or not that door locks when it's closed? Well, I, I'm not certain if it would be locked. I mean, I know you had to actuate that bar to open it. So, so a person would have, so I could just push it open from the outside. That bar has to be actuated on the inside. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, you'd have nothing to grab onto on the outside to pull it open. And nothing to trigger the unlock switch from the outside? Correct. There's, not, there's no keyhole or anything back there? That you recall? Not that I recall, and I can't see anything in the photo. Okay. And, you, and as you recall, all those lights were on, and just as they, just as they are here? That's correct. Uh, Corporal, during, during that night, um, this was, what, what day was this again? June? April 26th. April 26th. Uh, on that night, April 26th, uh, do you recall, did, did anyone in your presence mention the name uh, Rebecca Blatch? No. Thank you. I'm going to the question. Before I excuse the witness, Judge, I'd like to, I would move to admit uh, exhibits uh, 161, 162, and 163. 161 is the uh, Walther laser sight cover. 162 is the uh, two batteries, two watch batteries. And 163 is the uh, blood stain evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Now I don't have, I, I, I don't have 158, 59, and 60. I'll get, right? I'll get there. Okay. Yep, I'll Just get there. Just want to make sure we're on. Yes, sir. All right. We'll admit then 161, 62, and 63. Thank you, officer. You may stand up. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Yes, I do. Please have a seat. State your name for the record. AP. My name is Christopher Hare, uh, police corporal for the city of Norton Shores. Corporal Hare, how long have you been 
been a police officer? 22 years. And uh, how long of that, how much of that 22 years has been with the city of North Shores? All of it. Now, uh, back on April, well, do you recall the disappearance of Jessica Herringa back in April of 2013? Yes, I do. And uh, what role, or I guess what part of that investigation did you become a part of? Um, I was tasked with running down tips, tips that came in on the tip lines or silent observer. And uh, this investigation went on for some time, is that safe to say? Yes. And in that, in that course of time, how many tips would you estimate came in on, on her disappearance? I believe it was in the thousands. Now, I'm assuming you weren't, you weren't the only one running down tips. Were there other members of the task force assigned to that? Yes. And uh, could you describe, please, for the jury, kind of the process uh, that you went through when a tip came in and you were assigned that particular tip? What was the process? We were assigned the tip. Um, usually we're in a, in, a, in a partnership, myself and another investigator, and we would follow up leads, talk to the people, um, and then we would document what we had found. Now, let's talk about that documentation process. Did, <coughs> did you actually, now, for those, for those who don't know, is there an official way to write a police report and document an official police report? In our county, it's called the RMS system. Okay. And when you received these tips uh, and you did your follow-up investigation, did you go to R the RMS system and type a police report? I did not. Why? Because the procedure for this specific case was unique and we followed a different protocol. And that was followed by all the investigators that were following up on tips? Yes. Now, you didn't just talk to somebody, commit it to memory and move on, did you? I did not. What did you do? I received the tip sheet that had the information that was provided through the tip line. Um, Sergeant Baker and I uh, went and followed up the leads. We took notes from an interview that we completed or an uh, area we looked or searched, and we turned in the tip sheet into a basket in the be the command center. Now, was there somebody assigned then to take those notes and do something with them? There was. And what was that response? They would take the, they were put in a basket, they would eventually take them out of the basket and they would enter them into a computer system. Now, the, the reason for the computer system was what? To collect the data. All right. Did it make it easier to search? If, for example, let's say in tip 100 gave you a, you talked to somebody, and then at tip 300, uh, there might be a connection to tip 100. Correct. Is it easier to do it via paper or via computer to match it up? It would be, if it was all compiled in a computer system, it'd be easier to search. And, and was that the point of, of doing it that way? Yes. All right. Now, uh, so just so I understand, you every tip that you investigated, you took notes on, you documented, and that was turned in to be entered into a computer system. Yes, it was. All right. And was that was that the process done for every single tip that was received on the Jessica Herring investigation? That was the protocol. Yes. All right. uh, I want to talk to you about a specific tip. Tip two sixty eight that you received. I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 166. Uh, can you describe what that is, please? This would be a typed version of the notes that I had written on the carbon copy tip sheet that I had received upon going out to do my investigation. Okay. And uh, what date did you receive that particular tip to investigate? Do you recall? I don't re recall the exact day that I had the tip assigned to me. I knew I do know the date that I actually had contact with. All right, better, that's a better question. Then what date did you go out to investigate that particular tip? I investigated that tip on May 7th of uh, 2013. Okay. So approximately a week and a half or so after Jessica's disappearance? Yes. Now, uh, the nature of the tip was what? The nature of the tip was there was a 
gentleman that drove a silver van. Um, he was frequenting a local business. He wore a red sweatshirt, and he seemed to act odd to the employees of the local business. All right. And uh, when you received this tip, did you have any idea who this person was that you were going to talk to? No idea. Uh, ultimately, did it tell you where you were going to go to try and find this person? Ultimately, through my investigation, the, when I went to the business, it did lead to where I was going to find the person I was going to interview. All right. And uh, who was that person going to be? That would be Mr. Jeffrey Willis. And did you end up meeting up with Mr. Willis? I did. And, and where did you meet up with him? At his home. Which was where? I believe it was 1842 South Sheridan, or Sheridan. Okay. And um, when you arrived at 1842 South Sheridan, did you observe, well, what did you observe? Sergeant Baker and I were assigned this tip, and after leaving the business, we, uh, we drove to an address that I came upon for Mr. Willis through a computer search in our RMS system, um, and I observed a silver van parked in the driveway. Now, um, at, at this time, was, was Mr. Willis even a suspect in the disappearance of Jessica Herring? I mean, no. Was he, was he, you know, any more than a person of interest? I wouldn't even qualify it as a person of interest at that point. Okay. Just following up on a tip. Correct. Now, uh, were you able to make contact with Mr. Willis on that particular date, May 7th? Yes. Okay. And um, where did you talk to him? At his front door on the front porch. Okay. Did you stay at the front porch? Did you go inside or were you outside the entire time? Outside on the front porch the entire time at the door. Okay. Um, what information, if any, did you get from Mr. Willis uh, that particular day as it relates to the disappearance of Jessica Heron? As I spoke to him, I found that he was at the Exxon station on East Sternberg on the date that she disappeared. Did he yeah. indicate what time he was there? He said he was there about five, approximately 5 p.m. And uh, did he indicate at all whether or not he knew Jessica? He said he does know her. He did know her. Okay. Now, um, except for that 5 p.m. hour, did he indicate where he was uh, the rest of the, the day or night? He did. What did he say? He told me that he was at the Exxon station at approximately 5 o'clock. He bought mints. He might have been there for about three minutes. He talked to Jessica. Um, at, on that date, he left there and he went to a, a card shop where he played some card games. Um, I believe he said he was at the card shop until about 9.30 p.m. And he left the card shop and he drove to his home on Sheridan and he arrived there about 9.45 p.m. And he stayed there until 12.30 a.m. the next morning. Okay. Uh, and did he indicate to you whether or not he stayed at the residence after that 12.30 hour or left the residence? He said he left the residence. And did he indicate where he went? He said he went to his grandfather's home on Bailey in the city of Norton Shores. All right. And uh, did he indicate the purpose of making that trip at 12.30 a.m. on the, I guess would be the 27th? Correct. He said that he went to his grandfather's house to um, retrieve a board that he was going to use to repair or build up his um, dog kennel at his house. Now, um, did you were you able to talk to anybody else at uh, Mr. Willis's house that day? No. Did you ask to talk to anybody else? <clears throat> I asked him if he was home alone. If he was, if anybody was, if anybody else was at the home. And his response was. He well, said he was home alone. Were you aware at the time uh, that he was married? Through the conversation with him, I learned that. Okay. Mr. Willis told you that? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I, I don't know, Corporal Hare, if you asked at that time, did you ask at any point to talk to her if, whether or not his wife was home or that if you could talk to her? In the investigation, yes. I said I would like to speak with her. And uh, what was the response to that request? That that would be fine. All right. But could you talk to her that day? No. What, did, was there a reason given why? She wasn't there. All right. 
Now, did you also, as part of uh, what you were investigating, did you ask permission or seek consent to view any cell phones or any of that nature? I did. I asked him if he had a cell phone with him. And what was his response to that? He said that he didn't have it with him, that his wife had it with her at the time. So were you able on that day to get a cell phone from him? I was not. Now, uh, did you also get an opportunity to inspect the silver van? I did. And can you describe for the jury what, what you saw or what you didn't see? As we went to the van, Sergeant Baker, I, and Mr. Willis, we walked over there. He opened the van up, um, both the back hatch portion of the back of the van, as well as the side doors, um, and the van was empty, entirely empty. And it was actually clean. And it, to the point where I had vacuum marks on the floor. He said he had just had it detailed. Okay. Anything, I mean, at that point, Corporal Harris, did you see anything, find anything, or notice anything suspicious that would cause you to look any further? Nothing whatsoever. Um, now, at some point in time, well, as we fast forward to uh, 2016, did uh, Mr. Willis become more of an interest he did. And as a result, what did you do as a basis for your tip? I was given, given this exhibit and instructed to write a RMS version of a police report. All right. Any difference between what you first observed in 13, wrote down in 13, was typed in 13, to what your report reflects in 2016? No. I'm assuming that you were able to go back to the computer system and grab the original tip that was typed out. It was provided to me. I didn't actually do it myself. All right. But was there anything different that you recall? No. Now, at, at some point in time, Corporal Hare, did you attempt to call to try and talk to uh, Mr. Willis's wife? I have learned that I did do that. I do not recall that. All right. Let me, I'd like to play something for you, if you don't mind. That is my voice. Not that I recall.
Not that I recall. Okay. Uh, the person that you talked to back in May of 2013, is that person in the courtroom? He is. Could you point him out and describe what he's wearing, please? He is seated at the defense table wearing a suit with a blue tie. And I'll let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. It will. Nothing else, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Good afternoon, Court Mayor. Good afternoon, sir. How are you this afternoon? Doing well. All right. Um, the, the messages sat there were kind of staticky, and I want to make sure I understood. Aren't you saying in the second message that we no longer need you to call it back, or am I, did I misinterpret that? That's what that message said. Okay. All right. Um, your, your job was to, to run down to, to investigate tips. Correct. Uh, as a part of that investigation, um, w were you shown or were you um, given access to video or, or photographs other than a silver minivan? Well, maybe you didn't even get a silver minivan. You I don't believe I'm following what you're asking okay. me. I'm curious as, as to whether or not you know if there's, there was videotape inside the store, the Exxon store itself. I knew the, I, I knew the answer to that, yes. Okay, what is the answer to that? There was no video inside okay. of the store. All right. And back in April 2013, when, when you were first given this assignment, uh, or, or even back in May of 2013, when you, when you talked to my client, um, had anyone, had you heard of, had you, anyone mentioned you the name Rebecca Bletch? No. Thank you. I have a further question. Okay, thank you. You may stand down. Next witness, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. The people of the state of Michigan call Lori Sinclair to the stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. You said have a seat. State your name for the record. Lori Sinclair. Uh, Ms. Sinclair, what department do you work for? Norton Shores Police Department. And how many years have you been working for Norton Shores? 21 years. Now, uh, do you, back in 2013, in particular on the Jessica Herring investigation, were you assigned to assist in some fashion during that investigation? Yes, I was. And in particular, that, that involved either reviewing or looking through cell phones? Yes, that was part of my responsibilities. All right. Do um, you recall receiving a cell phone belonging to Jeffrey Willis? Yes. And do you recall what date that, that cell phone came into your possession? It was uh, the early part of May. Okay. Around probably May 7th or 8th. All right. Uh, and uh, is there a particular process that you go through when you're given a cell phone to examine? Yes. What is that? I usually, uh, it depends on whether it's a newer or an older phone. If it's an Android phone, then a lot of times I'll put it in airplane mode. Um, if it's an older phone, then a lot of times it, airplane modes sometimes harder to find so I will um, usually take the battery out 
and I will try to find the serial number or, or the, what's called the IMEI number. So I'll usually have to remove the battery to find right. that. In the case of Mr. Willis's phone, what process did you have to use? His was an older phone. It was, uh, it was like a track phone or a flip phone. So I removed the battery to find the IMEI number. Why is that important? It's, it's important, uh, especially when you're in this particular case, when you're looking at a whole bunch of different cell phones, um, you want to make sure that you, know, that you keep them all separate, and that's how we keep them separate is, is by their IMEI number, their serial number. Now, is there a process that you used in order to extract the information from the phone? Yes. Harder than flipping through it, you know, contact by contact? Yes. What is that? It, we extract the information from, it's, it's, call, it's called a UFED device. Um, that was the one that I used, and uh, the software, or the, it was called um, Celebrate, which was the device that I used. All right. And uh, just in general, if you could explain to the jury, when you, when you use that device, what, what does it give you? It, you can kind of pick what information you want, but it'll, it'll obtain information like contacts, um, you know, self text messages, you know, photos, um, you know, images that were sent maybe to another phone, you know, it, it, all kinds of different deleted images, you know, all, all kinds of information. So you can, you can get a lot of information from somebody's cell phone? Correct. Uh, does that include last known, like when numbers come in, if somebody calls you, being able to see what number called you and at what time it called you? Yes. Uh, and vice versa, if, I, if that phone calls somebody, being able to tell you what number that phone called and what time that, that uh, call went out? Yes, those are all date stamped and you can usually obtain that type of information from them. Okay. Now, uh, when you were able to examine uh, well, let me ask you this. Were you able to examine Mr. Willis's phone? No. What happened from his particular phone, like I said, it was an older phone. Um, when I removed the battery, uh, and I can remember from his phone, it had a l very low battery charge. When I removed the battery, I put it back in. I received what was called a fatal error. It, it blinked this yellow light. And then I, I was never able to charge it. I was never able to, to get extract any type of data from it after that point. Now, what, most importantly, Officer Sinclair, was that because of something you did or the condition of the phone when you received it? You know, I don't know exactly what would have caused that error, but all I know is from that point on, I did contact the MSP, the state police, and their experts over there in Grand Rapids, and I was told that there was nothing at that point that could be done with the phone, that it, I could not bring it to their facility, that there was nothing that could be extracted from the phone at that point. So did you receive a damage or did you damage it? It appeared to be actually in functioning position, you know, a, when I looked at the phone, when I received it, it powered, you know, it was on, and, you know, it appeared to be in working condition when I received it. It wasn't until I removed the battery that it appeared that it, and then tried to put the battery back in, that it was not in working condition. Great. Thank you. I have nothing else. Thank you, Judge. Exhibit 164, uh, do you recognize that letter? I do. And uh, is that a letter you authored? I did. And who is that letter to? It was for uh, Boost Mobile Communications. And do you want me to state the reason for the letter? Yeah, please. Occasionally I'll, I'll write these types of letters uh, to you know people that we've when we've seized their phones. And the reason behind it is uh, because when the phones are in our possession, uh, you know, obviously they're not being used or anything, and it's basically a courtesy so that the subjects don't have to pay or, you know, because if maybe we, we may even have phones up to a month or three weeks or, you know, so it's basically just a courtesy. They can take it back to their cell phone provider, and then they may not have to pay a, a phone bill. Gotcha. And uh, 
and, and that was in relation to Mr. Willis's home. Yes, if I remember correctly, it was it was requested by Mr. Willis. Fair enough. Thank you. <coughs> I, I move for the admission. I'm assuming you're not going to object. You said correctly. I'm not objecting. What number is that? One sixty-four. One sixty-four. Thank you. Also, Sinclair, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Fred Johnson. Um, the, the Exhibit 164, it, it, am I correct in understanding that, uh, according to that document, Mr. Willis voluntarily turned this form over to you? To our department, that's correct. Okay. In other words, it wasn't part of the subpoena or it wasn't seized. It was, he, he was asked for it and was turned over as far as you know. Correct. It wasn't part of a search warrant. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Okay, thank you, officer. You may stand down. Judge, uh, I failed to inadvert officially admit Exhibit 166, which was the tip sheet. I do that now, too. Which is which? The tip sheet. The tip sheet, Exhibit okay. 166. No objection. All right, it'll be received. Now, I don't have 155. I know. I, uh, I so skipped it. 155, 154, 165, and 23. Hold on one second, Judge. Let me go back over my notes here. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have 54 and 55. They were admitted early on. Those are the bullet fragments. Correct. I do have those. I'm sorry. What you don't have, Judge, is 158, 159, and 160. Right. And Exhibit 23. And 165. And 165. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been advised by the attorneys that that is the extent of the evidence that they have available to present today. So we're going to have to conclude the proceedings a little bit um, ahead of schedule. Uh, I'm sure that won't break your heart. Um, in any event, um, we will be re resuming this case on Tuesday next week at the same time at 9.30. So um, Monday, you do not need to be here. We'll be handling my uh, other cases on my docket on Monday. Now, um, this is a rather long break for you and uh, well-deserved. Uh, just please keep in mind the rules and the oath that you took to abide by those rules, which are we're not to have any discussion with anyone involved in the case. We're not to have any discussion about the case with anyone. You're not to view or listen to or read any media accounts of these events or conduct any experiments or research of your own. And other than that, you can do pretty much anything you want that's legal. Okay, so I hope you have a pleasant weekend. I will look forward to seeing you back here Tuesday morning at 9.30. Unless there's something for the record before we stand here. Do you have anything?